Brinanda Kroiso, uh, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Sally Lewis. I'm the National Clinical Lead for Value Based Healthcare in Wales, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our session today on value in health and the COVID recovery. I have an illustrious panel with me today. First of all, Dr. Jonathan Goodfellow, our National Clinical Lead for the Cardiac Network and consultant cardiologist. Michelle Price, our National Clinical Lead for Neurological Conditions and Hal Jones, the Director of the Finance Delivery Unit in Wales. First slide, please. So where are we now in the middle of this pandemic? Well, um, we're in a difficult space at the moment, aren't we, as we head into the second wave of COVID-19 across the UK and in many places across the world. Uh, and we're already feeling the impact of that here in Wales. And it is in fact uh, a true VUCA environment, a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous environment where we're having to manage, it, manage competing difficulties across the system. There's a plethora of guidance uh, coming from various professional bodies, um, reminding us of the importance of delivering essential services for many different conditions and preserving non-COVID disease outcomes, of course, and there are competing resources to do that given the reduced capacity in the system. Therefore, there's potential for inequity of access at times geographically and between patient groups as COVID-19 uh, progresses in waves across the country. We have to bear in mind that there's a relative time sensitivity of interventions uh, for all conditions and we must figure out how we're going to work together to prioritise those that are in greatest need uh, who have time sensitive conditions, uh, whether that's um, a condition that's potentially life limiting or life changing and we must prioritise this above all else. There are interdependencies in the pathway, so it's all very well if we can manage quick access to diagnostics, but then having done that, we need to be able to enable patients to progress to treatment quickly too. And all the while we're flexing up and down our capacity to deal with the COVID-9 infection in hospitals and in primary care itself. We must bear in mind the issues of safe care and consent for patients and be transparent and honest about that and carefully consenting patients, encouraging them to come forward with their symptoms and making sure that their environment is as safe as it possibly can be with respect to infection control from the virus. And finally, there's a growing backlog in planned care and we must have an eye on innovative approaches to planning for recovery and delivering treatment to patients who may have been waiting much longer than usual for their treatment. So the panel today are going to reflect on the impact in their own clinical areas, and then we will finish with a question and answer session around how we can together broker the various risks and challenges across the system uh, between clinicians and managers so that we preserve outcomes as best we can uh, with the resources that we have as we move through the pandemic and beyond. And we want to put forward an argument that at no time has value-based healthcare been more important than it will be as we move out of this pandemic. And so it's with great pleasure that I introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Jonathan Goodfellow. Good afternoon, everybody, um, and thank you very much, Sally, for the introduction. I'm the National Clinical Lead for the Wales Cardiac Network, and I'm going to try and stick to my brief, which is to firstly discuss the impact COVID-19 has had on our service in Wales. The next slide, please. Um, what we've found and what we've learned so far from, from the COVID pandemic is that people who have heart and circulatory disease and at the increased risk of death and complications. But we've also found that in the first wave, there's been a significant reduction in hospital admissions for patients with heart attacks. And there's a difference between patients who present with ST elevation by cardiac infarction, where we saw a 29% reduction, 
but a much bigger reduction in patients who had non ST elevation infarcts. We also have seen an increase in patients who have had out of hospital cardiac arrests and a significant reduction in hospital admissions for heart failure. Uh, they fell by 66%. And that number, that reduction, hasn't really reversed since the first wave has moved on. Uh, and we think it's probably due to changes in pathways. And the data has come from NICOR, and the data was published in the last few weeks. Next slide, please. So in Wales, through the first wave of the pandemic, all the essential services were maintained. Um, so people with heart attacks, life-threatening arrhythmias, acute heart failure, the services were there and maintained throughout. However, the routine and elective services were postponed or cancelled. And across England and Wales, more than 15,000 patients had their first choice procedures cancelled and most of them had no alternative offered. Next slide, please. So this has worried us because this, this postponement of investigation and treatment is going potentially to lead to increased morbidity and in some cases mortality. We already know and I mentioned that COVID itself has resulted in excess mortality. And we know that patients with heart disease are particularly at risk of this. However, again, from the NICOR data, there's been an excess in non-COVID-19 related cardiovascular deaths of the order of around 5,000. Next slide, please. So during the first wave, we saw an increase in the numbers of new patients waiting for appointments. Um, we surveyed all the health boards in Wales. We also saw a major increase in patients waiting for investigations and treatments, and that increase varied between a two and fourfold uh, increase across the health boards. And that's a major, major concern to us because compounding this, the capacity we have now to perform investigations has been reduced by around 50% due to the needs of infection prevention control and social distancing to prevent transmission of the virus to patients and staff. Next slide, please. So to summarise the impact, COVID pandemics had an impact across all parts of the cardiovascular disease pathway. Uh, the identification and management of risk factors for cardiovascular disease, which is usually in primary care. The deferred diagnostic tests and therapeutic interventions reduced access to specialist care in the community. And as we've seen from the data, reduced access of emergency and emergent care by patients. And in part, that's due to the very powerful messaging that went out at the time of COVID for people to stay away from hospitals. So in our response, which I'm going to come on to, we'll need to encompass the complex health and care system that needs to be a multidisciplinary response and networked along the whole pathway. And we need to really avoid silo working. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk now, the second part is about what are we doing with the recovery? But this, this quote, which is from one of President Obama's staff, is one I think is worth taking note of. Um, you never let a serious crisis go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things you think you could not do before. Next slide. So as Sally said, um, value-based healthcare is going to play a key role in how we face the future. And it's underpinning how we're approaching the recovery. Although I say that at a time where we're really in mid-pandemic rather than recovery. I'm going to talk about some of the innovations that have occurred directly as a result of the COVID pandemic. And I put improvement on that Venn diagram because it reminds me to say that not all innovations are going to be improvements. And we've done things reactively at the moment. We probably need to spend some time evaluating our innovations to be sure they are improvements and they are doing what we want them to do. Next slide, please. So our baseline for this was the cardiovascular atlas of variation which was published last year. And this looked at cardiac services across Wales with a value-based lens. 
it looked at the patient journey. Next slide, please. Uh, and we took the journey of a patient from his, his her community through primary, secondary and tertiary care. And we looked at the impact of the environment. Um, we looked at behavioural impacts such as smoking, misuse of alcohol, obesity. And we looked at metabolic risk factors and ultimately we looked at the, the phenotypic cardiac disease. So chest pain, heart failure, stroke. Next slide, please. The other thing we did with the Atlas, which was unique, was to actually use the finance delivery unit to cost the hospital episodes. So we had, in a, in a sense, good information about waste in inequity of access and uh, unwarranted variation. So in our recovery from COVID, where we are now, there are main principles. The first one is to protect patients and staff by minimising the risk of person-to-person -person virus transmission. And we're doing that by exploiting the potential of technology and data science. Next slide, please. So this is a, a schematic. This shows the map of Wales and the little black dots are all the hospitals in Wales. And it shows data flow. Now, currently, all our hospitals take part in national cardiac audits, up to six, and the data is sent directly from the hospital to London to Bart's Health at NICOR. We are proposing from our learning from doing the Atlas that our data is sent to NWIS to our national uh, data repository, where we can do data interlinkage to improve the quality of the data, to make sure all the fields are are there and then submit the data to NICOR. In such a way, we'll be able to improve the data quality and with improved data quality, we will get better information back from NICOR that we can make plans, strategic plans, treatment plans with. The other thing we're doing, and I'll mention a bit later on, is developing an app and we're doing that with NWISP. The NICOR had been producing reports on audits annually. They have moved to doing that report quarterly, but actually during the COVID first wave, they were able to deliver weekly reports. And the more frequent the reports that we can get back on, on the audits, the better it'll be for quality improvement methodology. Next slide, please. So the innovations we've undertaken, the first one I think has been embraced across NHS Wales, which has moved to remote clinics and telemedicine. Um, I started myself using Acurix for video consultations, and then latterly we've been able to use Attend Anywhere. But this has been a success, I would, I would argue. Uh, a lot of our patients prefer the video consultation, particularly the elderly age groups. There's a lot less traveling clearly and no problems with parking. And the, the letters that we're able to generate and the decisions we're making are equivalent in lots of cases to a face-to-face. -face. However, saying that caveat, face-to-face -face appointments are necessary and we are reserving them for specific patient groups. And the obvious ones would be heart failure, uh, suspected aortic stenosis or significant valve disease and we've set up one-stop clinics for those. Next slide, please. As I said, the big challenge we face really is the major increase in patients waiting for investigations and treatment. And in order to minimize contact and footfall through hospitals, there's a few innovations you might be interested in. We now have drive-through ambulatory appointments. Morrison Hospital set this up initially, it's been rolled out. Patients can drive into a pre-ordained appointment, it's signposted in the hospital grounds, they park outside the department, a technician comes out and either gives a monitor to the patient who then fit, takes it home and fits it, or they fit one on the patient and they drive and bring it back in the next week or the next day. Similarly, we've been using postal uh, monitors going out by post to patients to self-fit, do the recording and post back for analysis. We also have the remote monitoring, um, which we use 
routinely now for complex cardiac devices, such as defibrillators and uh, resynchronization therapy. These devices are able to transmit our um, devices in the patient's home to servers in the hospital. So we can upload information from the device and it can be reviewed clinically. So it means the patient hasn't physically got to come to the hospital to have it done. Now, at the moment, across Wales, we use simple pacemakers for bradycardias, slow heart rates, and they don't routinely have remote monitoring, but it is available at cost. And it's something we're looking at doing to, again to, re to reduce footfall for the future. Just as an aside, pacemaker clinics are one of the clinics where you don't discharge patients. You always follow them up. Next slide, please. So as I've said, these are the problems. We saw an increase in numbers of new patients waiting and this big increase in patients waiting for tests, which is a real health issue. Uh, and, and this leads me to this conclusion. We need to reset what we do. We needed to do this before COVID, but this allows us a chance to do it. We need to review the criteria for referral from primary care to cardiology. And we need to refer our, review our criteria for performing investigations. By that, I mean, in the future, I think there'll be a lot more advice and guidance done through electronic referrals rather than seeing patients or doing tele, telephone consults. And with investigations, we need to stop doing low value investigations on low risk patients uh, because we clearly can't do it. We have no capacity. So basically, don't waste the crisis. Next slide, please. The other message about this is one of the things Sally mentioned about consent. The messaging patients and the public had about the risk of COVID and avoiding hospitals was very powerful. And we've had problems getting patients to attend the hospital for a test. So that is an issue. And we've been trying to develop green pathways or COVID clear pathways, which is clearly a very difficult thing to do. I would suggest now is an opportunity to develop regional or community diagnostic hubs with attached treatment centres. This would be a real opportunity for NHS Wales to separate the acute service from the elective. And as someone who was in the previous job had to deal with hospitals during the winter where routinely we'd be cancelling elective work because of the acute pressures. I think it's an opportunity we must take. Again, don't waste this crisis. Next slide, please. So moving quickly on the recovery from COVID, we need earlier detection of the major risk factors for heart attack and stroke. I appreciate these are done normally in primary care, but footfall in primary care has reduced significantly because, correctly, people are having virtual consults. However, we've got a few projects running. Um, there's a telemonitoring project for hypertension we're working with BHF Cymru on. We're planning to pilot it in two GP practices. It's a project that has successfully been deployed in Scotland and I think will improve treatment and management of hypertension. The second one is atrial fibrillation. Next slide. And this, this is a piece of work that we've been doing now with the Stroke Implementation Group and the primary care clusters. Uh, we're, it's very simple. We're using Audit Plus, which is software developed by NWIS, which sits in practice databases and can pull out of the database patients who have AF and who have risk factors for thromboembolic events. And we can identify those who are known to have AF and risk factors, but who are not yet anticoagulated and then offer them treatment. Um, this is as well, this is now part of the new general practitioner contract in Wales, Crave contract. And we'd started this process off in January this year and have gone live across Wales by the end of March. But as we know, the end of March is when we really hit COVID. 
Um, we're also doing the second part of this, which is looking at patients who are anticoagulated on warfarin who are poorly controlled and offering to switch them to a direct oral anticoagulant. Audit Plus can be used to monitor how this has been taken up by practices and we can use hospital discharge data to look at AF related stroke and also look at hospital admissions for bleeding secretary to anticoagulation as a balance. Next slide, please. The other thing we're going to try and do is improve timely access to optimal management. And um, we are working with the value-based healthcare team and the finance delivery unit on this, an exciting piece of work. It's a national piece of work, but we're starting it in one of our health boards, which is Kumtath Morgano. The lead there is the director of finance. And the team involves an improvement advisor um, and a data analyst and a cardiologist. We're using QI methodology. We plan to introduce PROMS for coronary disease, which we're not using at the moment in Wales. Um, when we do get to the point of a new pathway, we are hoping to have co-production with patients and we've gone out to advert with the BHF Patient Voice Committee. And we're looking, if anybody's listening and wants to do take part, we're looking for the patient representations. The health board has three district general hospitals. We're going to work on the pathway in all three. And because the health board refers to two tertiary centres, we'll work with both tertiary centres. Okay. Uh, the, the plan of the FDU is to cost the pathway before and then after the redesign. And we have a lot of baseline data from the cardiovascular at its variation. And once we've done the learning in the first health board, we take it with us and move it on to the next and go across Wales and get this sorted out. Next slide, please. Now this is what we got from the Atlas um, and it, a couple of quick messages. This is the financial review of the hospital stage for the acute coronary syndrome pathway. If I say to you that optimum treatment is an angiogram and intervention at 72 hours, then you would hope that most patients could be discharged around three to four days. So for the average length of stay of nearly seven days at a cost of 20 million, there is significant waste in that in the system as it stands. So this is why we're addressing it. Next slide, please. So as I said earlier on, we're trying to exploit the potential of technology and data science. And last year we did quite a lot of work with one of our Bevan exemplars, who is a uh, IT architect and he developed the architecture for ACS hospital to hospital referral. And so we are working now with Enmos to try and develop that further into an app such that when in real life, when we refer a patient, we use the app. The app is then able to draw out all the data we need to populate national audit. So it's it's all done in one go. It's not a retrospective paper exercise. And as I mentioned and I showed you, we've used data interlinkage and we have a cardiac dashboard, which is in its infancy, but I think as time goes on, will become a very useful resource. Next slide, please. And this is my last slide. Um, the other thing that we're doing is reimagining the rehabilitation service. Now, not surprising, our cardiac rehab service was severely affected during COVID, partly due to redeployment of staff, but also because we stopped face-to-face -face appointments for the most part due to the risk of transmission of COVID. So we moved to digital solutions. There are online rehabilitation. And there's also in some health boards, they've been using the patient reported outcome measures to identify those patients who need more than just telephone or online, but need face-to-face -face review. The challenge always with digital solutions is, do you widen the gap and how do we maintain equity of access? So I've sort of set things up there, I'm gonna stop. I've set things up there now for hopefully Michelle to, to pick up and run with. So I'm gonna introduce Michelle Price, who is the National Clinical Lead for Neuro Conditions. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for the invitation to be part of this panel discussion. I think the past seven or eight months has been a hugely challenging time for everyone and will continue to be so going forward.
But I think we do have an opportunity in post-COVID world to do things better. So we need to learn from the experience we've all worked through to achieve better outcomes for service users, to be more efficient in our use of resources and sort of deliver on a healthier Wales. So I'm going to talk about my COVID value and healthcare experiences to date from a personal perspective in Powys as the clinical lead for neurological conditions and also as part of a post-COVID rehab task and finish group. Next slide, please. So my personal experiences will be the same as anyone that's been working in the, in the NHS since March, um, although I have been working in a community setting. On a positive side, I've been amazed at what can be achieved in a very short space of time, the flexibility, adaptability and resilience of healthcare staff. And I think the power of good multidisciplinary working and multi-professional working and the importance of good communication. What was really worrying for me was how quickly things can be stopped and how little we, we understood the impact of services to be able to say whether or not they were essential. So initially in Powys, many community rehab staff were redeployed to meet the expected surge in acutely unwell patients that we were expecting in our community hospitals. I think luckily we didn't see that surge in Powys and we have been able to focus on restarting services, although, as Jonathan was saying, a lot of them have been in a very different way. So I was also lucky to be involved in a rehab task and finish group that was set up by Ruth Crowther in response to the widespread stopping of rehabilitation services. And this was a fantastic opportunity to really build on some of the work that we'd already been doing as part of the Neurological Conditions Implementation Group or NSIG. Next slide, please. So my experiences in Powys were mirrored the feedback that we had from the more specialist neurological services across the health boards. So these were some of the comments that were fed back to NSIG in July. On the left, it's a service perspective and on the right, a service user perspective that was collated for us by the Wales Neurological Alliance. And I think these themes will be common across all services, specialist or otherwise. I've put in quotation marks about the clinical risk assessments and essential services, because when it came to it, there was very little research or data in neurological conditions to back up some of this decision making. Although, of course, as far as possible, it was based on evidence or experience. Um, uh, but this made it really hard to communicate clearly what those essential services were. So that led to quite um, uh, differences in service continuity across different health boards in Wales. And I think as well that had an impact on service confusion and concern and anxiety. Next slide, please. So the Allied Prof Health Professionals leads from across the UK, the four UK nations, published some collective guidance on the role of allied health professionals in COVID rehab back in May. And it defined four different populations of people affected. So while our understanding of population one, people who have had COVID is growing all the time, we still don't really understand what the longer term impact of the disruption in services will be for populations two, three and four. I think historically, quality and effectiveness in health services has been measured through process. So did such and such a thing happen in such and such a time frame? So we have a referral to treatment times and in stroke, we have the, 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 the Sentinel National Audit Programme. But it doesn't always capture the so what or outcome. Was a person better off after they had a treatment or intervention, um, which is where the patient reported out or clinical outcome measures are important. So going back to neurological conditions, there will be people living with a neurological condition in all four of these populations. So, and as I've said, the pandemic highlighted that we didn't have that robust, centrally collected and collated data to even start to understand what the impact of stopping these services were from a patient's perspective. Looking back, we know what has stopped from a process point of view, but we don't know what impact that has had. Although there will, there will be outcome measures that have been collected on individual patient level. So NSIG has worked with the Stroke Implementation Group on the development of a PROM and a PREM for the last few years that can be used across these populations of people. But these tools weren't in widespread use at the beginning of the pandemic because we were still working through the logistics of collecting, collating and reporting them. 
And we'd also talked about a value-based healthcare dashboard, having seen the cardiac one, and we're very jealous of that. Um, but again, that wasn't ready to help us in the, during the pandemic. However, the Neuro Rehab Task and Finish Group had done some work that, that did help with the development of the pathway. Next slide, please. So this piece of work was co-chaired by Ruth Crowther and also Claire Madsen, who's the Director of Therapies in, in Powys in response to the pandemic. And it aimed to be able to identify the potential demand for and impact of rehab for all four populations affected. But it was quickly realised that we were starting from quite a, a low baseline. Before we could understand the potential demand, we had to actually clarify what did we mean by rehab, as it's a term that means different things to different professionals and specialist services. And rehab is often embedded as a part of a specialist pathway and may sit across many directorates or service groups within organisations. And it's also delivered by local authority and the third sector. So we used the broadest World Health Organization definition that rehab is an intervention that optimizes a person's function and reduces the experience of disability by addressing the impact of a health condition on their everyday life. And then we base the framework and supporting guidelines on the WHO International Classification of Functioning. So we describe rehab interventions at an impairment, activity and participation level rather than focusing on diagnosis. Next slide, please. So once we'd had an agreement on what we meant by rehab, then we had to agree a way of measuring the demand and impact across all these specialities and all these settings for the port population. And I think there was a concern really that we were looking at trying to benchmark and it was about measuring services, but this really was about understanding what do we do well and where our gaps were. Next slide, please. So we try to look at this from a service user's perspective. So in line with value based healthcare. So what matters to service users rather than looking at the processes? But of course, you know, we need to collect activity data to understand about demand, effectiveness and cost of services. So we agreed a high level prom that could be used to track an individual's person recovery over time on their rehab pathway that could be used across health and community settings. And we agreed that the EQ5D 5L was probably the best tool, but we also looked at the Promise 10 and Who Does 12. And once we got agreement of what rehab is and how we measure it, we work with the delivery unit to develop a model to understand potential surge demand. All of these pieces of work are available on the, um, on the website and the link. Next slide, please. So Jenny Morgan and the modelers at DU work with practitioners that practitioners, service managers and make it as simple to understand and use as possible. We started with population one and tried to refine and define the rehab offer, um, considering the wide range and complexity of presentation of COVID. And this is where we could build on the work that we'd already done in the Neuro Rehab Task and Finish Group of NSIG. And we took into account the British Society of Rehab Medicine, the South Wales Major Trauma Network, uh, the Right Sizing Community Services Programme and Intermediate Care Programmes to come up with a model that focused on intensity of rehabilitation from a service user perspective rather than a service perspective and that didn't specify where rehabilitation should take place. So the next stage was to look at the, the research and emerging data around COVID to try and quantify how many people might be on the different pathways. So we now have a modelling tool that can be used to predict demand for rehab services over time. And as the evidence around COVID improves, the numbers in the model can be changed to update predictions. So in this example, when we first did it back in May, we were thinking that sort of one in five people 20% of people who had COVID would be um, admitted to hospital. Already we need to change this because we know that more than 50% of people are asymptomatic, so that will change the numbers. Next slide, please. So the tool though is, is really flexible and it's just a tool that we're learning how to use it and it's evolving as we understand it better. Um, while it was designed to understand the surge demand and impact of rehab of four populations of COVID, we can use it to easily use it to adapt to plan 
and help redesign services. It can be used at a single professions level. It could be used as a team, a service on organisational level. And this work is ongoing. Uh, Jackie Thornton, who's the assistant DOS in NRM Bevan, is chairing a Wales wide group to support organisations and services to use the tool. Next slide, please. So to summarise, team, you know, um, I think Teams has hugely helped. Um, I was really sceptical when they were talking about rolling out Teams at the beginning of the pandemic, but I think being able to deliver education quickly, the training, the way that we've been able to bring people together um, across health boards and organisation to really respond to the challenges of COVID in a timely way, I think it, 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 it highlights how important that technology is. I think going forward, it will help improve clinician and service user engagement and reduce the time spent traveling. So, you know, we can share learning and resources better across organizations, and that will really help us maximize the sort of clinical time that we have to spend with patients. So for NSIG, uh, we're looking at how we can use the uh, post-COVID rehab resources across neuro rehab, um, but we have to get better at collecting and collating data to be able to inform the model and use it properly. And I think we'll also continue working on a data dashboard for neurological conditions so that we can really identify what is effective and efficient service provision, where, the, where is there variation and inequity in service, um, and show that we can, you know, how we improve the effectiveness of services over time. And if we change, most importantly, the quality of life of people living with neurological conditions over time. So I think it's an exciting time. I'm really hopeful that rehab and neuroservices will widely embrace a sort of value in healthcare approach um, and really look at co-producing measurable improvements in inpatient care. So that's it for me. I'll hand over to, to Howell now. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Pranant, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can I just take this opportunity to say what a privilege uh, it is to be able to contribute to such a fantastic week of events and also acknowledge and thank the Value and Health Wales team for all of their incredible efforts in making this event a success. Having heard from Jonathan and Michelle on their perspectives on COVID recovery from a cardiac and rehabilitation context, I just want to try and pull that together with some reflections on some of our sessions to date this week and apply some of that learning uh, and insight to the role that value can play in recovery across all services with a focus on three things. Firstly, subsystem reflections of our world pre-COVID and the impact of the pandemic itself and what that means for post-COVID recovery. Secondly, what could and should a COVID recovery world look like with a value based approach at its centre? And finally, the role of finance in enabling and ensuring that value is at the heart of our system's recovery from this pandemic. So let's consider some context and reflections from this week of our system pre COVID and what is most relevant in shaping our COVID recovery with a value lens. First of all, let's recall and consider some of Alan Brace's opening remarks on Monday and reflect that in the UK, we have a health system which compares favourably to other healthcare systems in terms of process efficiency. The Commonwealth Fund analysis of comparable healthcare systems ranks the UK as the highest performing in terms of care processes and one of the lowest performing when it comes to health outcomes of our population. Whilst this is inherent inherently influenced by the underlying health and disease burden of our population. Our reflection is that a system which is already considered efficient in process terms at a low cost per capita has had a focus on improving efficiency, arguably at the expense of effectiveness. How we allocate and utilize resources to drive best outcomes needs to consider at its heart the effectiveness of our actions and interventions and the impact they have on the outcomes that matter to our patients. Simply, we need to focus on ensuring we are doing the right things and not the wrong things more efficiently. Secondly, in reflecting on some of Sally's considerations earlier in this session and over the course of this week, let's recognise that we live in a world of finite resources, be they money, physical infrastructure or workforce. 
and we have unlimited want and need which places ever increasing demand on our services. In that scenario, we have choices to improve the use of our available resources as we're unable to increase them without limitations or constraints and we're unable to reduce need. If we have efficient processes and equitable provision of services, delivering what really matters to patients and value is the action that will drive greatest benefits to the populations that we serve. The third factor to consider for me of our pre-COVID system is the healthcare systems and their activity and performance are significantly influenced and driven by time measurement. Whether that's being seen within four hours of arrival at an emergency department or a maximum waiting time for seeing a secondary care clinician in an outpatient setting or a total maximum waiting time for elective treatment or equivalent. Whilst often timeliness of treatment is vital and can be a proxy for delivering good outcomes, this lends itself to a volume driven system where a capacity shortfall to meet demand is calculated and identified with solutions proposed to address those gaps. And traditionally, as we heard from Judith Padgett, Paget, the Chief Executive of the Niren Bevan Health Board earlier this week. This involves increasing our capacity, especially our workforce through undertaking additional activity on a short term basis, which isn't sustainable. Healthcare systems are traditionally and typically therefore incentivized as a consequence to deliver solutions for volume and not value. What therefore has been the impact of COVID-19 on these key systemic variables and factors, which means value needs to be at the heart of our recovery. There are both challenges and opportunities and picking up on some of the messages from Jonathan and Michelle so far this session. For me, some of those key considerations are there will undoubtedly be an increase in population need, as we have heard from Michelle, be they patients with prolonged symptoms of COVID-19 patients who are awaiting paused, urgent or routine interventions and who have further deterioration in their function. People who have avoided accessing services and are now at greater risk of ill health. And for those people who are socially isolated or shielded groups who have an increased health risk. Time bound measurement alone in isolation will not be sufficient to optimise patient care and direct care at those who need it the most. Consideration of those patients at greatest risk and risk of harm need to be at the forefront of our mind post COVID as Jonathan so eloquently described today. There will be a backlog of treatments and interventions to address with resource limitations. Therefore, we will have to consider that with the economic impact of COVID-19, health will be competing for resources with all other sectors and require its own compelling narrative on how it will drive improved outcomes linked to the effective utilisation of resources. Increasing our capacity from a workforce perspective in a traditional way will simply not be an option. Our workforce is and will be a finite and precious resource and we will not be able to scale capacity to meet demand in the traditional way. There will also be a need to ensure that unwarranted variation and low value activity, much of which has been impacted by COVID-19, as we've heard today, is much reduced with a focus on high value activity in our recovery. There are also significant opportunities where the pandemic has had an impact. For example, in emphasising the importance of the population health and prevention agenda and our collective system understanding of the segments of our population and that not all patients and cohorts of patients are the same. A volume focus on treating numbers of patients will have to move to a value focus of outcomes that matter to individual patients. There are also numerous and well documented examples and we've heard some today of the scale of innovation that has underpinned our system response. A key opportunity relates to digital which needs to be embedded and strengthened as a platform for healthcare communication and delivery with patient outcomes at its heart. What therefore does a post COVID recovery system look like with value at its centre? What are its attributes? Well, for me, it's a system where there is a consistent and visible measurement of outcomes that matter to patients and cost that mean prospective choices on how we utilise resources are clear in areas that maximise value. 
that there is a focus on managing patient care in relation to risk and harm alongside outcome that matters to patients. It is a data driven system, but as Helen Thomas outlined on Monday, not for reporting regulation and assurance purposes, but for insight and making informed choices at all levels. Engaging our patients in co-production and co-design of services will be a must, and we've had many great examples this week, such as the use of PROM in direct care for heart failure and many other services. It is a system where we have a workforce that operates to the top of its license, with a clear understanding where multidisciplinary roles and inputs drive improved outcomes. Activity and interventions that are low value will need to be reduced with a greater focus on high value interventions to improve outcomes. Technology and digital will be at the fore of managing our system and interactions with patients effectively, enabling co-production and direct care with a focus on outcome that matter to patients, as we've heard from John in relation to cardiac services today. And it's a system where health and industry are aligned and focused on value-based approaches to improving outcomes for our patients and the populations that we serve. Finally, for me, just some reflections from a finance perspective in how we ensure professionally that value is at the heart of COVID recovery. For me, there are six key aspects to this, which are personal reflections. We need to provide system leadership in endorsing and advocating a value-based healthcare approach, working with our peer groups and networks. We need to ensure that resources are allocated and utilised to drive best outcomes with considerations and emphasis on effectiveness, not just efficiency. We need to set an environment along with our clinical colleagues and service leads on a common language and currency to drive change. And for me, that common language is value-based healthcare. We need to provide insight from a system down to patient level to inform value-based choices and decision-making empowering clinical teams with excellent intelligence and insights and colleagues such as Sally, Michelle and Jonathan. We've seen numerous examples this week of the breadth of work, tools, techniques that provide a blueprint and enable us to do just that. We need to also develop and provide financial frameworks that incentivize and reward the right behaviours and focus on outcome and value and not volume, is innovative in its approach, to enable solutions, be they physical infrastructure, technology, industry-based, revenue or capital in nature. And we need a system that distributes resources in line with evidence of what activity and interventions drive best outcome. And this includes redistributing resources across pathways, settings and services, again, as we've heard in some of the session today. Uh, finally, as a personal reflection, I think we need to be brave. Our post-COVID recovery is going to be challenging. Uh, but with great opportunity. Uh, and I really like John's quotes earlier in that in that space. Um, we've got a real opportunity to improve the outcomes of the population we serve and we need to be brave, embrace and enable the changes that are required. Thank you, Diolch Fawr, and I'll hand back to you, Sally. Thank you, Hal, and um... Thank you, John and Michelle, also um, for sharing those insights from from your own parts of the world. Um, we now have uh, 10 minutes or so for, for questions. Um, and the first question I have up here is the following. Um, and I think uh, I'll probably come to each of you in turn to ask for your reflections on this. So. Um, our questioner is saying, as a result of the COVID-19 response across health and social care, where will we and should we see the greatest impact for patients? And how will we also measure the qualitative and quantitative impacts? So I'm interpreting that question to mean um, the negative and positive impacts. And, you know, I think what 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 worries you most um, and what encourages you most? And if I can come to you, John, first, and then Michelle, and then Howell. Well, thanks. I, <coughs> so, greatest impact for patients as COVID, I think, from our patient population, that's going to be um, to a degree access. The access 
I hope the future will be the access via primary care to secondary care in terms of advice and guidance will be much quicker than it has been in the past. And that will be because we'll be routinely using electronic referral methods where you can respond to an uh, electronic referral as a consultant the same day. So advice and guidance will be there, but the expectation to see somebody hopefully will be diminished. The other impact, which I've already mentioned, is this impact on tests and investigations. I think we need to give the population at large you know, a heads up that we cannot be returning to what we were doing before COVID. It really wasn't sustainable what we did before. I echo again what Howell said, we need to have a new world where we're not doing low value tests. Um, and in my specialty, a lot of tests are done to reassure that the test is normal. Uh, they're low risk patients often, and they are therefore low value tests. And I think we have to be brave in the sense of saying, I don't think there's much wrong with you. You don't need the test on the, on the simple grounds that we don't have capacity to do the test. We really can't afford to be doing lots of low value investigations. So that was the first bit about the, the impact. I think that would be the first bit. The second part I missed was about measurements of. Can you just remind me what the second part of that question was? Yes, I think it's a question really about uh, measuring the the impact qualitatively and quantitatively of the pandemic. And uh, I guess my personal yes. reflection might be that it, it'll take some time, but be good to hear your thoughts, John. Well, one of the things that we'll need to do in the new world as well is, is ask patients, you know, patient reported experience, patient reported outcomes as something we are we have ambition to do um, and if the new world as described comes off then patient reported outcomes and patient reported experience will be rewarded in terms of where, where the investment is coming from NHS Wales so I think that's one way we'll do it as you, you're right it'll take a long time we're very good at counting numbers as, as Howell said we're very very good at that excellent world beating so we can do lots of numbers of things so a very good efficient process people but I think what we're just saying today is all about outcome not so much about output so yeah we can measure the out outputs but we really need to measure the outcomes which, which is what value based is about thank you John and uh, uh, Michelle can I turn to you now I impacts that uh, worry you and measurement of overall impact in the longer term yeah thanks Sally I think when it comes to things that sort of worry me about sort of COVID, it will be about the potential for inequality. I think there's huge um, uh, positives around people being access, able to access services virtually, but then there is a community, those with communities, communication or cognitive problems. And I think we need to make sure as we go forward, we bring those communities along with us as well. Um, and again, there's also a slight concern about, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, so, um, people being able to start and that's really important, but they need support um, and education and rapid access to services to be able to do that as well. So those are the things that worry me, but they're kind of positives at the same time. I think what's excited me is the speed uh, that things can actually happen, which I've been working in the NHS for nearly 30 years and I've never seen things happen this quickly before. And that's really reassuring. And I think this idea, you know, we don't have the same processes to measure anymore. So pro measuring process is gonna go out of the window to a degree, I hope, and that focus on outcome from a patient service user perspective is really important. And I think the other thing that's really good is that creating a common language. Um, I think previously, but certainly coming from a rehab and a therapist perspective, we use language that isn't necessarily um, understood more widely or people in finance will talk in terms. But I think if we can have a common language that is across finance, planners and clinicians, I think we've got an opportunity to really shift things forward uh, much more quickly. Thank you, Michelle. And um, Howell, I want to slightly alter the question for you because there's two really good questions just come in that I want to try and squeeze in before the end of the session. So the first one is, 
How do we explain to patients who are now on very long waiting lists that we want to move to a value-based system which may not include what they're waiting for? So, so really, how do we bring patients on, on that journey? My own reflection on that would be uh, that we need to be transparent and honest around the challenges that we're facing, but also come up with positive plans for how we're going to um, meet a backlog um, and, and provide alternatives uh, to perhaps traditional pathways of treatment. And John touched on one of those in his presentation when he mentioned regional working, which I would also support. But, but Hal, this is a, a really important question and I'd, I'd really welcome your reflections on that. Can I take, take that because to start off? Because we're trying to draft um, a new set of guidance for the referral criteria from primary to secondary care, as I mentioned. But we're also having to triage all the patients currently awaiting tests because of the potential long delays. And the triage of those patients waiting and then some of those patients will not have been seen. They would have been uh, allocated to a test before being seen. So what we'll try and do is pick out from the information we already have those who are high risk and prioritise those. Those who are low risk, we have plans to remove, the, remove them from the list and say we're not going to do the test. Now, if you think about it, if we just wrote to the patient that would just lead, in my view, to the patients going straight into primary care or even straight back to an emergency department setting. So what we'll need to do is, is actually have planned time for cardiologists to ring up and speak to the patients, check the information we have, check the symptoms and explain, as you just said, Sally, that the, the landscape's changed. And although they're low risk and the, the test itself potentially be of low value in terms of changing their management. We should be able to speak to them and say we're not doing this test, this is why. And give reassurance that way. I don't pretend it's going to be easy and it isn't going to be cheap because it's going to involve significant job planning and, and consultant time to clear the backlog. But otherwise we've got a massive demand capacity problem that we're facing for which there is no easy answer. Thanks, John. Uh, totally agree. So, so Hal, as we are running out of time, I'd like to change the question for you. Forgive me, um, but it's such a good question. I, I can't resist sneaking it in at the end. Uh, I like the Be Brave agenda. When can all Welsh citizens have access to their health information and be able to remotely communicate with their healthcare professionals? That's quite the question, Sally. I'd prefer the one before. I think uh, <laughs> I'll try and I'll try and answer both. Um, so, uh, in terms of when can citizens have access to their health information, I think there's a couple of different levels to that. There's, I think, a reasonable expectation in the fullness of time with appropriate data disclosure and all of that expectation that patients should be able to see the totality of their information, including cost and utilization of healthcare resources. That means they have informed choices in terms of optimizing their care. I think that's a journey that we have to go on and some aspects of that are more achievable than others uh, in the short in the short term. Um, just in the time we've got, I also want to just cover the question before Sal, just because I think it's important from a finance perspective um, in terms of how we explain to patients on very long waiting lists that we want to move to a value based system. For me, we've got to make it real to people. So um, what do we really mean by that? So we'll all have our sort of healthcare stories and interfaces with health. From my perspective, a close family member of mine during the pandemic who's had multiple knee operations and an expectation of cure has had a realization that really they want mobility and movement and their best interaction was the healthcare service was with a physio and not with a surgeon. So they're actively seeking different types of intervention going forward. So for me, it's about having clear actions with individuals and an element of personalized care that they own. And I think that's how we explain and manage that narrative. Thank you, Hal. Um, 
we're almost at a close now, so I will have a go at answering the, the Be Brave agenda um, question um, regarding Welsh citizens having access to their health inf information and being able to remotely communicate, not just with consultants, of course, but with the healthcare system as a whole. This is, this is something that uh, is described and uh, there is a commitment to in NHS Wales um, and that programme of work to enable that to happen in a very widespread way. It's already available in some pockets in, in Wales. Uh, we, hope we'll, um, we hope we'll be funded next year for that to be rolled out much more systematically, um, but we're waiting um, for the impact of the COVID pandemic really to know the timing on that, but it is absolutely the direction of travel and I completely agree with the, the questioner. Um, it's time to draw the session to a close now. Uh, we haven't had a chance to answer all of the questions. That always happens, but don't fear. We will endeavour to provide written answers to all of the questions that, that have been submitted. So thank you very much for, for those questions. Uh, and it falls to me now just to thank once again uh, our fantastic panel, Howell, Michelle and Jonathan. Thank you very, very much for your time and for showing us your, your wonderful insights this evening. Uh, and um, goodbye, everybody. <laughs>